So today, uh, I want to start off with uh, talking about uh, CU. Anybody CU fans or bus fans? Uh, <coughs> Yeah, there's been a lot of hype around this guy, right? Around Dion, there's been a lot of hype. I know there has been. I've enjoyed watching it, partly because like he and I are close to the same age, and I grew up watching him play, you know, Atlanta and and, and the Yankees, and I that's the fun part for me. And I enjoy seeing an organization change. There's a part of me that just enjoys seeing that. But one of the, uh, you know, he's using social media in a really amazing way, in a way that probably many many uh, football coaches haven't done. But uh, but there he has been accused of a lot of hype, hasn't he? And I get it. He kind of brought it on himself. I came across some numbers. Did you know, uh, since Deion Sanders, there's been a 20% increase in applications for Colorado's 2024 incoming freshman class, um, totaling more than 68,000 prospective students, which is a record. That's crazy. Uh, the Daily Camera noted that 50.5% of that increase is applications that have come from black students, and before, just 2.7% of CU student body is black. Um, an estimated of $113 million has been brought into Boulder. That's crazy when you look at that number. Isn't that amazing? Um, so uh, there might be a little bit of hype, and and it's it's uh, people are benefiting from from the hype as well. About two thousand years ago, there was a question that said something like, and I'm going to use it in today's language: What's all the hype about? What's all the hype about? There was a man named Jesus who rode into Jerusalem. And people had different opinions about this guy. Some thought he was a really good teacher, a really good rabbi. Others thought he was a miracle worker. Others may have thought, you know what, I was there when he made fish tacos for over 5,000 people. I was there. Other people are like, my aunt. My aunt touched the hem of his garment, the hem of his robe, and she was healed after suffering for 12 years. Or I was there when that guy went through the roof. And he went right before Jesus, and Jesus said, your, your sins are forgiven. I was there. So there's all these rumors around him. Everybody has an agenda. Why are you at church right now? Why do you think you're here? Hold on to that question. You think you're here because someone invited you here? Or maybe this is your church home, and I'm so glad you are here. This is a great place to just seek God. Let's look at the story, Matthew chapter 21. Verse 1, as Jesus and the disciples approached Jerusalem, they came to the town of Bethpage on the Mount of Olives. I can stop right there and preach a whole sermon on the Mount of Olives. That's an amazing place. Jesus sent two of them on ahead. How many did he send ahead? How many? Okay. Go into the village over there, he said. As soon as you enter it, you will see a donkey tied there with its colt beside it. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone asks, what are you doing? Just say, the Lord needs them. And he will immediately let you take them. This took place to fulfill the prophecy that said, tell the people of Jerusalem, look, say look with me, look. Your king is coming to you. He is humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. The two disciples did as Jesus commanded. They brought the donkey and the colt to him and threw their garments over the colt, and he sat on it. Most of the crowd spread their garments on the road ahead of him, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. Jesus was in the center of the procession. And the people all around him were shouting. Let's shout it out, guys. Praise God for the son of David. One more time. Praise God. And let's keep going. Blessings on the one who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise God in highest heaven. The entire city of Jerusalem was in an uproar as he entered. And here's their question. Who is this? They asked. And the crowds replied, it's Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth 
in Galilee. Lord, open up our eyes by your grace. Holy Spirit, work in me and through me and give me the words to say. Holy Spirit, you be my transcript. Lead me and put your words within me. I pray that every soul hears a word from you. I pray that we are changed because of your word. And we have a moment, if we haven't had it already, that we have a moment, God, that's undeniable that your Holy Spirit touched our hearts. So work in the heart of every person, sinner and saint. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Why are you at church today? So the question was, who is this? Well, happy Palm Sunday. Happy Palm Sunday. It's one of my favorite times. Um, as Jesus walked into Palm Sunday weekend, um, I, I have different thoughts. The question that they had for him was, who is this? And we've been in this series called More Than a Name, and we've been looking in the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and how over and over there were moments where Jesus, his identity was questioned. People were wondering, who is this guy? You know, when he calmed the storm, the disciples were like, who is this guy? What is he about? I don't understand. Or when he forgave that paralytic and he said, your sins are forgiven. Everybody looked at him and said, who does he think he is? Who is this guy? Or when he healed that guy who was born blind, born that way, and he healed him. And they were asking, well, who is this that healed you? And who is he? And who does he think he is? Kind of thing. Over and over, you see this question surrounded Jesus, his life. Who is this? Palm Sunday weekend. So Palm Sunday happens, and it's actually recorded in all four Gospels. And you see this donkey involved, which is pretty amazing. Uh, there's a bunch of people. When I, uh, when I, uh, when I, I grew up in, you know, I didn't go to church a lot. Let's just, you, a lot of you know that. I was not a good Catholic, and I didn't go very much. But I, one thing I remember is the, the palm branches. That's what I remember going to church, everybody waving, kids waving palm branches and this kind of thing. And I, I didn't understand it completely. And I thought, well, what is that about? Palm branches and, and Jesus and a, and a donkey? And I don't get all of this stuff. But there's this incredible spiritual um, orchestration of events that's happening around palm Sunday weekend. Uh, Jesus is coming in on, on something, a famous Jewish holiday known as Passover. And he's coming in, and this is a time when people are bringing in their lambs for offering, and, and this is a time when they remember something that happened all the way back in the book of Exodus. And we'll talk about that later. But so the, the timing of Jesus coming in is really significant. In addition to this kind of thing, Jesus also he, he did this miracle that got a lot of attention. He raised this guy from the dead who had been dead for four days. And now he's walking around and people are looking at him and asking questions like, did you see a light? What did you see on the other side? What happened? What was it like? And so Jesus is getting a lot of attention. He is, just like Kaylee said earlier, he is a wanted man when he rides into Jerusalem. Now, you just need to know something. Where Jesus is at, at a personal level, with his, his mind and his heart, is completely different from where the crowd is at. The crowd is shouting, praise God, and eventually we'll read Hosanna, and they're shouting all of this. And they're doing that because they want to be delivered from Roman oppression. They are looking for an earthly king. They're looking for a King David 2.0. That's what they're looking for. So when Jesus rides in, he's coming in to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. They're not looking for a world savior. They're looking for a Rome savior. There's this prophecy that, uh, that is quoted in Matthew, and it comes from Zechariah chapter 9. It says, Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He's righteous and victorious, yet he is humble, riding on a donkey, <laughs> riding on a donkey's colt. Now, as I read this, I thought, oh, how epic can I read like donkey? Like when I say he's riding on a donkey, doesn't that excite you? And I thought, no, it doesn't, not at all. It would have been better 
if Jesus was like riding in on a black stallion, you know what I mean? And his hair is blowing in the wind and he has six pack abs and he's coming in and he's got a sword and he's got a knife and he's coming in with a shield. And I mean, doesn't that make you excited? Something about like, I don't know how fast a donkey can go, but I don't think they can walk very fast. And I, I've, we have a donkey in the front. We wanted to bring it inside but we thought it was a little bit of a risk because if it had to go, it had to go. You know what I mean? Then everybody would be looking at the donkey and forget. You know? So we thought we'd just leave the donkey out there. But it's from the School of Mines. So it's a really smart donkey. It's a smart. All right. I'll stop right there. Some of you. <laughs> that was Terry's joke. Uh, so uh, anyway. But uh, donkeys don't seem that impressive, do they? Unless you're going down the Grand Canyon, right? Something like that. But they really aren't like, I'm going to get in the, it's kind of like, you know what, if you're pastor, I, I don't, I look at a guy coming in on a donkey and I don't necessarily think king. I don't think success. I don't think leader necessarily. I just look at a guy who's really taking his time getting around. I mean, if we're beyond, it'd be kind of like if your pastor pulled up in a Yugo or something like that. And you say, my pastor is so successful in life. Look at him coming out of that Yugo. It just doesn't fit really well. And he's riding in on a donkey. And the scripture, I mean, he could, you know, one day he's going to come back. And it's not going to be a donkey. It's going to be a horse. It's a whole different situation when he comes back in the book of Revelation. But here's what I want you to see. Humility is more powerful than pride. Zechariah 9, 9 tells us he's a humble king. Isn't that cool? We don't typically associate humility and strength together. In fact, sometimes you might confuse humility with weakness. Sometimes you might confuse that. Uh, someone who's humble is someone who's timid. Or someone who's humble is someone who you might, you might think they just don't have a lot to say or whatever. They're not flexing. But to be humble requires security. It, it means you don't have to flex. You know who you are. To be humble requires this, this confidence in, in who you are. Jesus comes in humble. He comes in humble. And then in John chapter 12, we read about this guy named Lazarus. When all the people heard of Jesus' arrival, they flocked to see him and also to see Lazarus, the man Jesus had raised from the dead. Then the leading, the leading priest decided to kill Lazarus too. It's like, they, like he died once and now they're trying to kill him a second time here. For it was because of him, because of Lazarus, that many of the people had deserted them and believed in Jesus. You know what this reminds me of? You know, the best sermon is a good example. The best case about who God is, is your changed life. Your life that's changed by the Spirit of God, your life that has been changed by Jesus, is the best billboard that there's a living God who sees you, and he cares about you, and he wants to have a relationship with you. Your transformational, your changed life is better than 10,000 sermons I could preach. So you got to remember that it's, it's, as we go on life. Let me just say the other side, too. Don't hurt the name. If Jesus is not living in you and through you and you tell people you're a Christian, but people look at your life and they're wondering, where's the fruit? I hear the words that come out of your mouth, and I need to be convinced that you're going to church, brother. I see the way you're treating others, and I need to be convinced that you know God, you really, you really grew up in the church, you really, you, all of that, are you sure? Because I look at you and I don't see any difference. So don't hurt the name. Don't hurt the name. Jesus, Lazarus did this, you know, Jesus raised this Lazarus from the dead, and, and, and he comes out, and, and I always want to do the Lazarus jump right here. This is him coming out of the tomb, Lazarus coming out. And when he comes out, everybody sees him, and because of Lazarus, there's all these converts. There's all these people that surround Jesus, and they start following him. He is incredibly popular. And I love the way verse 16 says, At first, his disciples did not understand all this. And you see with the disciples, they're trying to catch up. 
They're trying to figure out, okay, so what is all this about? I don't understand what this is all about. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. In verse, John chapter 11, verse 55 says, It was now about the time for the celebration of Passover, and many people from the country arrived in Jerusalem several days early so they could go through the cleansing ceremony before the Passover began. Verse 56 says, They wanted to see Jesus. And as they talked in the temple, they asked each other, what do you think? Will he come for the Passover? I'm going to show you a picture of of Passover here. This comes out of Exodus. And during this time, when you read about this story, this is one of the last, the last plagues that, that the Israelites went through when they were delivered from Egypt. And uh, God sent this angel. And the angel's job was to put this, this, this blood over the doorpost. And uh, this was a sign. So when the angel of death went over, if they saw the blood on the doorpost, they, everyone on the inside would be safe and not experience death. And it was the blood. It's the same picture for us today, guys. That's what happens when someone receives Jesus Christ. The blood of Jesus Christ is on our doorpost. Glory to God. And we're safe from condemnation. We're safe. We're safe from hell. We're safe because of the grace of God. It's not because of our works. It's not because of anything we've done. It's because of the blood of Jesus Christ. Thank you, Lord. During Passover, there was 256,000 lambs and there was uh, 2.7 million people in Jerusalem. It's a lot of people. And they're all there to bring a lamb. They're all there for the, to, to offer a sacrifice to the Lord. Hear this. God is an orchestrator of events. His timing is just as important as his purpose. When you understand this, you will learn to trust God, even though things don't develop as quickly as you think they should. God is an orchestrator of events. Sometimes we might say a prayer to God and we feel like God like doesn't hear us. You know what? God hears us. Sometimes it's wait. Sometimes it's not yet. And sometimes it's a prayer that, that God, God is like, okay, this is against my will. This is against my will. So I'm not going to answer this prayer, but God hears every prayer and he respects the prayer and the timing of everything of the circumstances just as much. Palm Sunday reminds us that we have the capacity to misunderstand God's purpose and miss what he's doing in front of us at the same time. I think it blows me away that Jesus is riding in on this donkey and they're shouting out praises to him. Guys, and just a few hours, these people are going to be shouting, crucify him. People can be fickle, can't they? The other thing I see, that I, I look at how incredible focused Jesus was. A lot of times we don't think of Jesus as a great leader, but he was an amazing leader. And he was an amazingly focused. He heard all of the praises. He heard, you know, the palm branches and the coats and everyone. And there was a lot of flattering going on, but Jesus didn't get caught up in it. Timothy Keller said, Palm Sunday is an incredible parable of the lifelong mismatch of what we think we need and what God has provided. What we think we need is almost always shallow. God always gives you what you would have asked for if you knew everything he does. Isn't that so good? You know, you know, I like, I appreciate this quote. Basically he's saying your, your prayers are too small. That's what he's saying. Your prayers are too self-centered. It's been said before. If God answered every one of your prayers, Who outside of you and your family would benefit from it? Anyone else? And Keller is saying, you know what? Um, We have this, there's this mismatch between what we think we need and what God has provided. Many times our problem is we lack the perspective that God has. And we're like, why did this happen? Or what is going on? God, I need you to do this. And God has a bigger perspective and he wants you to trust him. He wants you to trust him in the midst of everything. 
There's these mismatched needs. Um, if, and the, another thing to say is some people wanted to crown Jesus so he could deliver them from, from Rome. They wanted an, another miracle. They were hungry. They wanted another meal, whatever it is. But it was all focused on the here and now. How is it that we can so quickly misunderstand the purpose of God? Matthew 21, 9 says, The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna, say how's Hosanna out loud with me, Hosanna, to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. You know what Hosanna means? Save us. That's what it means. It means save us. It's a phrase of desperation, not celebration. Save us! Hosanna save us save us from whom Rome that's what Israel wanted save us from Rome Jesus rise riding in and you know where he knows the cross is ahead of him in just a little bit and it's not about Rome or just about Rome it's much bigger than that it's this place of desperation. I want to ask you a question. As I, thought, as I looked at this passage, I, wanted, I was prompted to just ask you this question. What is your prayer of desperation? What is that? What's your prayer? Do you have one? A prayer of desperation. Like, God, I need you to move bad. I need you to deliver me bad, God. I don't know what else... To do. I'm ready to just give up. I need you to work in his life or her life or my life. What is your prayer of desperation? Everyone should have one. If you don't have one, that's another prayer. <laughs> that should be another prayer. There might be a little bit of pride seeping in there. But a prayer of desperation is an awareness. It's a hunger. It's not a place of, of celebration. It's desperation. The Israelites were desperately looking for a savior to free them from a Roman army. How many times are we desperately looking to God to help us in an area that doesn't reflect our true desperation? Have you ever said a prayer that has no desperation in it? I have. But have you ever said a prayer that includes desperation? And when there's desperation, you'll do crazy things like, God, I need you to work, and I'm gonna just going to fast. I'm going to stop eating. I'm going to stop drinking everything. I'm gonna, I need you so bad, and I'm going to go to church. And that place of desperation. Here's what they didn't realize. God was using Rome. We can ask God to deliver us from something that God is using for a greater purpose that we don't fully understand. That unanswered prayer, that discomfort, that inconvenience, it's that tool for God to use. Here's what's interesting about this whole story. What's interesting about this whole story, go back to that picture, Tyler, that very first picture of uh, Palm Sunday. The, what's interesting, um, the Palm Sunday one, what's interesting about this picture is when, when Jesus is riding in, everybody is celebrating Jesus. So they're doing the right thing for the wrong reason. They're celebrating Jesus. They're saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. So it's true. He deserves praise, but they were doing it for the wrong reason. They wanted to be delivered from Rome. They were not celebrating him as the Lamb of God who's come to take away the sins of the world. That's not. So you know what that tells me? We can do like, like the, the, the right things for the wrong reasons. We can go through the motions of church. We can go through, do all the things that we think we should be doing. We can sing songs, but our heart hasn't caught up to the lyrics of the songs. <laughs> so we're singing the lyrics, waiting for our heart to catch up. And we can go through all those things. We have that capacity to go through the motions of it. Palm Sunday is a day when everyone thought they knew God's job description. Jesus is coming in to deliver us from Rome. 
made me think about this. How many people have given up on their faith because God didn't do what they expected him to do? How many people have given up on God or lost hope on God because God didn't do what they thought he should do? Or God didn't answer that prayer in the time that they thought he should answer it. Or God didn't work out that circumstance or that situation in a way that they thought he should work it out. Over and over, you know what I've discovered? Is God takes us to this edge and he says, trust me and walk by faith. I've been walking by faith with him now since I got saved at the age of 18 years old. And I'm just going to tell you, I've never grown out of it and I haven't grown out of it. He still calls me to this place of the edge. It says, trust me. Trust me, I'm working things out. What if God knew more than you? <laughs> Here's their problem. Here's their problem. When you look at Israel on the day Jesus rode into Jerusalem, you see something. They want Jesus to change their circumstances. Hello. That's what they want. Jesus is here to change my circumstances, to deliver me from Rome, to give me a better life, to give me a better quality of life. Jesus is here to change my circumstances. You know what? I need a better job. I need a boyfriend. I need a girlfriend. I need a husband. I need a wife. I need more money. I need Jesus is here. Hear this. Here's our problem. We want God to change our world without changing us. That's the mic drop verse right there, don't we? We want God to change our world, to change our circumstances, but I'm okay. I don't, need any, I don't need any change here. I'm pretty good. And the Lord looks at, here's what I think. If Israel had a choice, if it was left up to them on Palm Sunday weekend, I think they would have been, I think they would have preferred to have Jesus save them from Rome than for Jesus to be the savior of the world. Think about that one. Just knowing the capacity of our self-centeredness, our perspective has a lid. It made me think also sometimes all we can see is Rome. All we can see is our problem. That's all we can see. And we don't see the connection between the human dilemma and the human soul. We don't see the connection between the human dilemma and the human soul. Let me say it this way. There's this lack of connection to the soul. We can look at our problems and not connect it to our soul. Hear that? We can look at the lack of peace in our home and not connect it to our soul. We can look at our addiction issue that we have that maybe we haven't truly confessed or come around to, but, and not connect it to our soul. We can look at our hurt. We can look at our wound and not connect it to our soul. We can look at our restlessness and not connect it to our soul. We can look at our marriage and not connect it to our soul. We can look at the problem we have in the relationships with that person and not connect it to our soul. We can do that. We can look at our financial challenges and not connect it to our soul. We can look at the bad luck in our life and not connect it to our soul. We can do that. We can look at the trail of wrecked friendships in our life and not connect it to our soul. We can do that. We can look at that. Israel wanted Jesus to fix the problem, but they didn't want to own the problem. They were the problem. Hear this. You need Jesus to save you. <laughs> you need Jesus to save you. You need Jesus to save you because you need saving more than you think. Jesus can save you from everything and anything. He's a big God. He can save you from your sins. He can save you from that bad decision that you made. And you're hoping you're not going to reap the consequences of your decision. Jesus can save you from that. He can save you from that crisis. He can save you from yourself. Glory to God. Jesus can save you. Think about this another way. 
we say sometimes like, God changed my circumstances and we're not so excited about him changing our hearts. If God ended every war on the planet today, if he ended every war on the planet today, that's a lot of war. But he did not change you or us. We would be at war tomorrow. If God ended poverty and injustice today, all poverty and injustice gone, but did not change us, there would be poverty and injustice tomorrow. You hear that? If God ended all of your problems today, but he didn't change you, you'd have problems tomorrow. That's why God wants to change you. That's why he sent his son. I like what Erwin McManus said, as much as we want to distance ourselves from the problems in the world, we cannot separate ourselves from the human dilemma. We are the human crisis. It's us. It's always easier to look at other people and say, you're the one with the problem and it's your fault that I'm in this dark place. It's your fault that I'm in this place. It's your fault that this has happened. It's your fault. And the things that I do wrong, I'm doing because of you. It's always easier to look and blame at others. But real growth happens when you look at yourself and you say, start with me, Lord. Start with me. If, if we're honest with ourselves, we're way more comfortable with God working with our circumstances more than God working with us, if we're honest with ourselves, aren't we? We're in love with ourselves. What are you asking God to save you from? Let me ask you again. Why are you at church? <laughs> Why are we here? You might think it's for whatever, but you know what? The, the, the Palm Sunday weekend is a weekend of great misunderstanding. The people had different agendas and they were waving palm branches because they wanted to be healed again. They wanted to be saved from Rome. They wanted to be fed again, whatever it is. They wanted to be on the next King David to be. I mean, they all had different agendas and it's just like that when we come to church. We have different agendas and you could miss what God is doing. I'm gonna read to you again, Zechariah 9.9. Rejoice, O people of Zion. Shout and triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He is righteous and victorious. Yet he is humble. Riding on a donkey. Riding on a donkey's colt. If I was writing this script, it wouldn't look like that. But I look at this verse and it says, rejoice. Why should you rejoice? Because the Son of God is writing to you. Why should you rejoice? I think one of the problems or one of the ways, I was just telling my wife Grace this today. I, I think one of the strategies of the devil, he has many strategies, but there's not any new ones. But one of them is, you are unworthy. Devil tries to convince you that. You're unworthy. That's a lie from the devil. Um, have you ever, like, been discouraged before you even get out of bed? I had one of those mornings this week. I'm like, I haven't even got my feet off of the bed, and I already feel discouraged. Like, I failed already. And I just realized, you know what, devil? I'm not going to let you rob my day like this. I'm not going to let you rob my morning like this. The day is just starting, and the mercies of God are new every morning. Glory to God. I'm not going to let it start like this. I'm not going to let that happen. But what I love about this verse is Jesus is riding in. And I think about it like um, if I showed up at your house unannounced, unannounced on an evening, knocked on your door, and I just walked into your room and walked into your living room and just walked into your bedroom, I mean, if you're like us, part of us, we would want to clean up and this kind of thing and want to try to get the house in order. I didn't know you were coming. I didn't know. And here you see the Savior of the world who is holy and righteous, and he's riding on a humble beast, and he is humble himself, and he is holy, and he comes in, and he comes into our space where we're at in that darkness, in the messiness of our life. And you know what he says? It's okay, 
I'm here. I love you. I will take care of cleaning this up. I will make you holy. I'm here. It's okay. I love you. And it's okay. I will make you clean. And I will make you righteous. And I will get you on your feet. And he comes in humble because he's a humble God. And he loves you. And he cares about you. And he wants you to know his grace and his mercy. And he wants to have a relationship with you. That's what Jesus does. That's what Jesus does. That's what Jesus does. He comes in and he says, I'll take care of you. Your head comes in. I'll take care of the mess. It's okay. You're not worthy, but the blood of Jesus is worthy of everything. And he comes in on Palm Sunday weekend and he says, I love you. I'm with you. There's nothing you can do that said that's greater than my love and your grace. And there's no mess in your life that's greater than Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ can take care of all of it. And somebody put your hands together and praise him. Thank you, Jesus. You are worthy because of the blood of the lamb. Praise the Lord. I want to give you an opportunity. I love it when you guys stand up while I'm preaching. I get all excited and everything. I'm not going to keep on preaching. Oh, praise Jesus. I want to give you an opportunity. You came to church, and I don't know what you had in mind, but let me just say this. You're the project. Turn to the person next to you and just tell them you're the project. It starts with you. It starts with you. Let Jesus have his way. Can we do that? Let's pray. Jesus, thank you for your presence. Lord, I worship you right now, and I thank you, God, for using me in spite of me, and you deserve all the glory. I just want to publicly say that and confess that in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for your spirit. Jesus, I'm so grateful that you rode in on that day, knowing what the next few days would look like. And right now, Lord, I just want to lead this wonderful, these wonderful people into a, a relationship with you that's deeper than when they came in. Why don't you say this? Just say Hosanna. Say Hosanna. Oh, say Hosanna. I mean, save me. Jesus, we need you. Some of you, maybe you need to ask Jesus into your heart. Just say, Jesus, come into my heart. Be my Lord and Savior. I need you. Forgive me for my sins. I turn to you right now. Others of you, what's your prayer of desperation? Tell them. Tell them your prayer of desperation. Oh, Lord, hear our prayers, God. Oh, Jesus, hear our prayers. Oh, Jesus, Holy Spirit, if you are free. I know you do. Thank you for your grace and your mercy. Thank you for your Holy Spirit. Oh, God, move in our homes. Move in our work, our school, our country, <laughs> our world. Jesus, 
move in our circumstances. You're worthy of all of our praise, Jesus. We, we worship you, Jesus. In your name we pray all this. Amen. Amen.